and welcome to UK Games Expo, Virtually Expo. And this is another panel this morning that you are joining us for. I am Chris Hanley from Darker Days Radio, and this panel will be getting into game writing or how to get your foot in the door, uh, amongst other ways we put it on various bits of social media. I am joined by a host of writers across the entire RPG spectrum, and I will let them introduce themselves right now. So we have Steffi. Do you want to give, give us a brief introduction? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Steffi. I'm a writer and a developer, so I also do the development side of the books in, in, in addition to writing. I've worked for uh, Onyx Path a lot, Modifius, Chaosium, uh, Angry Hamster Gaming, Angry Hamster Publishing. Um, and um, I uh, last year, I uh, with Liz kickstarted this lovely book. Um, so that is me in a nutshell. Oh, if anybody wants to find me on Twitter and uh, uh, follow me for uh, gaming updates and um, social justice rants, uh, I'm 100 things I love. That's 100 the number of things I love. Excellent. And we are joined by Lloyd. Hi, everyone. I'm Lloyd. Um, I'm a writer and a sensitivity reader for various books. Uh, I'm currently working on Rivers of London. Woohoo! And I help the sensitive reader of a game called Bastion as well out there. And I'm around, so say hello. Excellent. And we're joined by Liz. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz. I'm the owner of Angry Hamster Publishing. Uh, we just re recently won an uh, Indie Groundbreaker Award for our game Afterlife Wandering Souls for Best Setting. Um, I've also freelanced for a bunch of different companies. Um, I was the lead developer for the Crescent Empire book for John Wick Presents. I've worked for Honest Facts Path Publishing, Modifius, Gallant Night Games, just to name a few. And you can Excellent. find me at Angry Hamster RPG. On Great. And we are joined by Kat. Hello, lovely people. Um, Kat has not seen 9am from this side for a real long time. So please excuse me for a little bit spacey at times this morning. I'm also an RPG freelancer. I've worked for Wizards of the Coast, Onyx Path Publishing, Hunters Entertainment, Jeff Stephen Games, Gallant Knight Games, and some other people. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and self-published on the DMs Guild a lot. And I run my own games company called Ecstasis Games, which you will start seeing stuff from soon cool and um, briefly from my side other than podcasting for dark days radio i've published uh done freelance writing for onyx path publishing for uh cubicle seven on the war on all the warhammer rpgs now uh and third eye games on the pit primer plus also self-publishing through the st vault which is equivalent to dm's guild but for world of darkness and chronicles of darkness and co-wrote Noble Armada 3rd Edition, which is a, a war game. Right, with all the introductions done, um, we can get to the main agenda, which is getting into game writing. So, uh, really, I mean, there are so many routes into getting into writing for RPGs, getting into game writing, whether it's Kickstarter, self-publishing, and so forth. So, really, we're just going to get a feel for how's everyone's routes in how how has that been and uh, what have they learned from those roots and uh and really kind of what what skills they feel maybe helped with that so who wants to jump in with perhaps saying if they went in through a more traditional route you know with submissions to open calls and so forth if that was their first jump into game writing and that's steffi yeah so i did the uh traditional route of i answered an all call for onyx path and I think two or three developers contacted me, uh, not all at once, but um, um, they contacted me based on that submission and they hired me for various books. And um, the good news is that the RPG industry is fairly small. So once you have a proven record of delivering good content, meeting your deadline and being nice to the other freelancers, it's very easy to then branch out and go to other developers and go, oh, hey, can I work for you if you I need my credentials, you can ask this person who I uh, delivered work for. And then it's very easy to, to get in touch with people and, um, and get more work. But was that, I mean, with that, I mean, there are open calls for, for companies every so often over, uh, in a year maybe, or over a number of years. Um, how many how many times does it take to get taken up on that? I mean, others may I, have an answer for that as well. Like they may have yeah. submitted multiple times. I don't know. I, I got I got hired on my first. 
Um, there's also cases that I applied to that I did not get the job for. So, um, so just that I got hired on my first doesn't mean you you have everything in the bag. They're gonna there's gonna be people that don't like your work. Um, in general, um, uh, I would say send in the best submission you have, and don't it doesn't have to be perfect. Don't let perfect be the reason that you put off sending your submission. I mean, a good submission is going to get you better. It's going to get you further than a perfect submission sitting on your desk. Mm -hmm. um, so hand in a good submission and then wait. Because the thing is, if you send in a submission for like Aberrant and Onyx Pass is currently not doing Aberrant books, um, you're probably not going to get hired. Um, so just wait. It doesn't mean that they didn't like you. It means that they don't have any Aberrant books. And because we have a high volume of submissions, it also means they're not going to get back to you with, oh, it'll be later. Um, I would also say submit if you want to submit for additional lines, then go ahead and do that. Because, um, like I said, uh, if you if you hand in something for mage and it's good, but we don't have any mage books, there's still the the chance that uh, another developer is going to say, "Oh, but they're good at mage, which shares the same mechanics as so many other games." So then, uh, send in that. Make sure they're all good. Um, and this is the important bit, follow the guidelines to the letter, exactly. If they want you to sign your name like Dr. Rabbit, sign it Dr. Rabbit. Because the thing is, um, when you do work for hire as a freelancer, they're going to send you an outline and you're going to write what's in the outline. And sometimes it's very detailed and sometimes it's just give me a thousand words on covens in Britain. And other times it'll be really detailed, like I want 250 words for each on a coven in uh, London run by Merlin, a coven in Edinburgh run by Gandalf, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Uh, but you are going to be working with an outline, no matter what the company is. Um, cool. And being able to stick to the outline is super important. Mm -hmm. And sticking to the submission guidelines is basically your first test to see if you can do that. OK, um, so copying over Lloyd, what was your route into writing? Because, I mean, your 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 big your first big thing was what bastion land and now we're that's just bastion oh just bastion sorry yeah that's bastion um, so bastion. so i had the opposite effect of what steffi went through i have been fortunate enough to have been in the rpg industry for so long that people sort of go hey lloyd would you like to help me on something like that and that's what happened with bastion uh d grayson came up to me and was like hey i really could do with someone who is from who's actually from west africa who can take a look at this book and look at it. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll give it a shot. Went through it. I saw there was something to go out. There was some sections that were just like, no, mm -mm, not today, girl. Mm -mm, get, get, get out, get out, girl. Just, just get up, just check it out. And there were some other parts. I was like, actually, I can improve on this, like the Ghanaian naming convention that we have. And I threw some stuff in. So the grace was like, yeah, let's help with that. And ever since then, because I helped out on one thing, it meant that people were like, hey, Lloyd, you did this. Could you help me with this? Because... I do love writing, but I'm so unconfident about my writing that I pref I've always been lucky enough that other people have given me the big go ahead. So with me, it's been less about how good I am, about more who I know yeah. that has got me the jobs that I'm in, which is a very different way to Steffi from when they came in. But Steffi also has had jobs where they've been like, oh, hang on, you're Steffi the Man. Of course we love you. Like, get, get, get over. Get, come, on, come on into this book there. Put your name right here. Put your name right there, Mr. Rabbit. So that's how I got into it on my side. So Lloyd, with uh, what you're saying there is is that while you would say traditionally you wouldn't have seen yourself as a writer in the sense mm -hmm. of as feeling confident with your writing, the, the reason you were brought on is because you had very domain-specific knowledge which yes. enhanced a product. So yes. even, even though your writing may not have been perfect, you know, you within that context, you were able to practice it and have someone foster your writing and add to someone else's writing. And it becomes a wonderful, wonderful final product, which goes out there and is is accurate to what you understand of your where you grew up. Yes. And also there is nothing quite like having a bunch of writers in a room who are yeah. always happy to help you improve what you already have. Because I would not be the person I am today if it weren't for Jerry and for everyone else who's helped me in all the writing stuff that I've got to where I am. Cool. Um, and then, so Kat, what was your kind of route in? Was it similar to Steffi's or different? Yeah, I didn't so much get my foot in the door as kick the door down and then prevent them rebuilding around me, I guess. Mm. 
I came in through community content programs, specifically the DMs Guild. Uh, and the great thing about the DMs Guild is you don't have to wait for somebody to respond to a submission or an open call. You just decide what you want to make and then you make it and then you learn to edit and source artwork and do layout and be a complete one person publishing house with, you know, varying levels of success and results. Very small <laughs> success. Um, but that branched out into... I mean, from that, I developed just a lot of samples I could send to people. And a lot of people kind of got to hear about my work from me shouting about it on Twitter and various uh, friends and family, found family, I should say, this isn't nepotism, um, that I'd worked with on the DMs Guild, getting into positions at role-playing publishers and kind of taking it from there. So essentially, I went for be very, very loud, make lots and lots of stuff, and I hope that you make some friends along the way. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, I think that's quite similar route to my own um, from both obviously reading lots and reviewing lots and interviewing lots of people for a podcast. You begin to know who's who uh, and hopefully our reviews and insights <laughs> into things are, not, are, are useful. Uh, but yeah, I, I went through the community content program uh, and I think because of uh, one particular book which is the that was why I was hired on to say uh, vampire um, most recently. I think for 40k, I think it was literally at UK Games Expo 2018. I just waffled lots to the developer, and he was like, "You know lots of this." It's like, "Well, yeah, I work for Games Workshop as an undergrad in in a shop, spending my money on discount models." Anyway, <laughs> but that just shows you know you know a lot about uh, a, a thing that they want to write about. Uh, Liz, um, what was your route? Because I mean, obviously you you also have done Kickstarters and so forth for Angry Hamster Publishing. So was is your route through Kickstarter? Is it through community content, or is it through more a traditional route, or was it just someone grabbed you because they they were like, I know someone and I need them immediately. Well, it was a bit half-half. So um, I actually started writing in the industry um, during the times the times of a fourth edition D&D. Um, and I had a friend who um, had a friend who, <laughs> uh, who wrote for the Living Forgotten Realms and the my best friend she's like hey I like your GMing I bet you could write for Living Forgotten Realms you're always writing stuff for us um so I did that for um a few adventures and then nothing really came of it and I was like okay that's cool um and then I ended up I was always writing um and I had written my own role play system and I thought you know what like I'm just gonna put it on Kickstarter um, I'm going to make an effort, so I feel like I've made an effort, but probably only my mom's going to give me money, and I'm okay with that. Um, you know what I mean? Like, if it's, like, my mom and my best friend and, like, one random person I don't know, like, I'm good. Um, and that was my game, Witch Faded Souls, which ended up actually being uh, quite a success, um, at least for my first Kickstarter. And from there, uh, that actually gave me inroads into the industry because I met a lot of people while trying to promote my game. Um, and also a lot of people knew my name. So that's actually how I um, started developing for 7C because they saw that I could bring out this full color um, 8 by 5 by uh, 8.5 by 11 inch book um, all by myself. And they're like, hey, if you can do that, maybe you can do more things. Um, so that kind of gave me my inroads to the career that I've built around myself today. That's that's quite interesting what you're saying about is with the self-publishing, like showing not only can you write, but also fully form a product and that shows you have a vision for the entire process and and you know delivering a product that's that's looking good that reads well that's well laid out so um that leads us I think then into what kind of skills do you think help within getting into writing is is it is it just writing or does it help to have other things there that can be utilized when someone hires you? What, what, what are people's skills that have been, you know, you thought, oh, they want me for that now, not just for writing words. I mean, I think Steffi mentioned it, but like finishing things on time and well and acting professional. Um, I have been picked up for, a to pick, uh, I'm often asked, pick up projects that people have left off um, who haven't finished things on time or maybe it didn't go well professionally. Um, so that skill, I think, you know, in any job 
that really, really helps you if you're tenacious and you actually do what people are asking of you um, and you're thoughtful about it. I mean, that can only help you, especially in an industry where a lot of people consider it a hobby and not a job. Yeah. So. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that because like coming from software engineering as my day job, um, you know, you can have so many features, so many ideas to add to a product, but if it doesn't hit the the desk of the people that you want to use it it's it's vaporware it's dead it doesn't do anything so keeping to the brief is important and just because you write ten thousand extra words doesn't mean you're going to get paid for it because your brief is two thousand words like why are they going to pay you more for it you you know that's maybe egotism anyway um who else wants to jump in on uh, on on you know about maybe being professional or, or, or skills or training that you have that have helped in yeah, writing. I would say tying into your example of writing 10,000 when you were hired for two, please don't do that. Uh, as the developer, it just means that I now need to cut 8,000 words. It's terrible. I, I know you're enthusiastic about the job, but if I hire you for 2,000 words, I need you to give me 2,000 words. Like maybe two and a bit, but not 10, preferably not even three. Like, just stick to your word count, please. Because it just means I need to edit your stuff. And I don't want to, because all of it is good. And I know you loved writing all of it. Do not put me in a position where I need to go, these 8,000 words, gone. So one, don't do that. And And two, very important, uh, is be nice to work with. I will, and I hear this from a lot of developers, I will hire a person who gives me good writing and is nice to work with over a person who gives me fantastic writing and is a pain in the ass. Because I can teach the good writer to be better and I don't want to work with the pain in the ass. That's mm-hmm. it. Uh, Kat, you were going to jump in with some comments? Yeah, I was just going to jump in with why we don't give 10,000 words when someone asks for two. And it's, it's partly to spare our developers the pain of having to cut 80% of the work which is usually really good but it's also because if you're making a print book then if you've written an extra 10,000 words you've written an extra three pages yeah which means you've got to pay for an extra three pages to be printed and you've got to pay for a layer artist to work on three extra pages for you and probably find some art to fill those extra three pages and that is expensive so rather than doing the developer a favor you've actually just cost them a ton of money and the only quicker way to not be asked back than costing a developer a ton of money is to just be an asshole. Mm-hmm. And the two are very closely connected. The, the other the other thing is actually interesting you said about X words turning to extra pages because it's never just an extra page because pr- a print printed media is not that simple. It's like that's an extra four pages really because of how they fit in. It's something like that. I don't I can't remember the exact details, but it's it's never that simple as I've just added an extra page to it. That's just another page in a PDF. No, that's an extra like extra content and could even change how the book is bound, I think even that can happen. Yeah, Things it can can change like that. Yeah, and uh, keep in mind that if it's work for hire, they probably need to, if they want to use your work, pay you for it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so in addition to all that extra stuff, they now need to budget for you being eight thousand words. So just don't do it. I'm going to cut it. You've, that's basically it. It's just going to get cut, and we'll all be very sad. If you are hired for two thousand words and you have inspiration for twelve, please put ten aside and put that in a community content thing later. Oh yeah, uh, Lloyd. Any comments on this? Because you you've been involved in like production of books. Is, is this right? There is nothing more terrifying than having to tell your line manager that you need two more pages. I, I have seen, <laughs> so I work for Modifius and I have seen Sam physically reach for like something to throw at someone at the sort of conception of having to write an extra page in. But one of the other things as well is that you get, people get a lot of submissions for from companies for book writing and they'll come up and be like, hey, can I do this or can I erase this? And a lot of writing stuff come through. And once again, I've always been a big fan of, yeah, it's kind of who you know more than what you know when it comes to being hired by that. Because if they, if the person who is take, who's in charge of looking at the list goes, right, I don't know anything about you. The first thing you see is going to go, who knows this person? Are they decent? So your reputation is very big. So if you're, if you're like, oh, I'm cats, excuse me, um, 
I'm Kat Evans. Uh, you know who I am. Oh, yeah, right here, right there. Hi, I'm Lloyd John. Who are you? Whose mm-hmm. man's is this? They're just going to throw you out. So, like, your reputation is very important. And you're going to get a good reputation by constantly giving good work, by constantly, by being someone who writes a lot, and by being someone who showcases the writing a lot. And there's a lot of ways to go past that. Once you get your foot in the door, you should never stop writing. Mm-hmm. Because that's how you move forward with every single extra thing you do, no matter how tiny it will get there. Also, people who work with you will suggest you for other things. So don't be a punk to those people. (laughs) Give them what they want and help them out. And they will help you out as you will help them out as you go along. And eventually you have your own writing team. Just like just like that. And I think that's that. That's true for so many different industries. It's like <laughs> working as a researcher. Um, you can you can have wonderful people with wonderful ideas, but if they're a pain to work with, it and it's just not worth it um, unless there are le- you. Know, I mean, that's not to say you can't have people bring up legitimate issues with how something's being done. But again, you know, there's lots of people that are possibly working on what you, you're working on as well, but unaware of all these problems. And, you know, you might be creating lots of havoc for them as well when they want to get a product paid, you know, out because they need to get it paid yeah. as well into their bank account. Um, right. OK, so with that covered um so i think we've covered quite a few things because i mean we've we i mean this we've talked about like how you get yourself known i think it's quite obvious that if you build a good reputation uh writing good words and it you know getting them there on time working to the brief your name will get around because as Steffi said as i was said the the industry is small it's very incestuous like someone writes for one company they write for another they develop on one product and write for another product uh for a different company um so what other good advice is there for getting known i mean we have social media for its benefits and ills are there any ways you would say this is the better way of of utilizing that or are there other things like blogs that to show off your work that you don't think it deserves yeah work that maybe shouldn't be you don't think deserves to be paid but you want to get it out there is there stuff where you you can do like that i'll tell you one thing that's odd this is this is a slightly odd way because i know the rest of y'all got like some real professional stuff to go for so bear with me um stand by your values when it comes to social media there are a lot of writers who will give a statement about what they believe in or what they are and people will catch on to that because if just like just like reviews if i think that the person's work that i'm reading has the same mindset as i have when it comes to certain things like my like maybe the cultural views or political views everything is political don't pretend it's not all those <laughs> aspects people are more likely to read your work for that because they're like, well, I like the way you view the world. I want you to bring that view into your writing to show it there. Your values are what gets you there for all the good and the ill that that comes with. But that's one of of the very easy and simpler ways to sort of like get people in because once they know who you are, they'll respect it. Excellent. Okay. And anyone else want to jump in on that about, you know, just social media and, and getting yourself known in other ways? I, will say, I, I think we are also seeing an uptick in uh, people who come from live plays, actual plays, um, um, being asked to write things based on their creativity. And, um, um, and we do see some of that. As well mm. as well. obviously you, they still need to be a good writer um, if you're um, if you're a bad writer then in the end it, it is a book uh, but that is a good way to get noticed and to have people go oh I like that person let's see if they can write and and sometimes they're already writers and then you can use your uh, social media presence to promote your writing and then people will doubly go oh I like them and it turns out they can write that's awesome let's hire them I guess Definitely. I would add review things. Um, oh, writers need reviewers. Yes. Publishers love reviewers. It's a really great way to get yourself known as a helpful person who understands what games are about, why they work, why they don't work, and helps you to put your point of view across and bring a little bit of your personality 
out into the world in a way that you kind of can't do in 280 characters on Twitter. Oh yeah, <laughs> Twitter is short form is is uh, horrible at times. Uh, Liz, any other time. other comments on promotion and getting yourself out there via non traditional means? Maybe I am I'm the single most terrible person at promoting myself. So I normally just latch on to wonderful social butterflies like Lloyd and ride their star into <laughs> into assistance. Um, but I would say, I think one thing we haven't mentioned is conventions, um, like not the non-digital kind at one point when we can all go into the world again. Um, conventions are a great time, a great place to meet people um, and play games. And, you know, even like after the convention's done and you guys all are uh, just speaking with, you never know who you're going to speak to um and you know if you if you show a general interest in games and things you like if you have the ability to go to a convention that's also great right you never know the connections you're going to met meet and who is going to remember you and maybe think about you later cool um i just checking the twitch ring because we are taking questions mainly towards the end but uh someone actually did put up a good one which is what are the typical mistakes you see people make when you know submitting work or or or, or um or writing uh, for uh, a, a freelance gig or, or so forth. Um, one thing personally, which, you know, from also uh, my day job stuff is, has involved, uh, r well, marking uh, undergraduate thesis and reports is we have spell checkers on computers everywhere and we have them on online, you know, writing uh software like you know google docs or whatever flavor of writing software you want to use there are spell checkers plus also for free there are things that check your grammar as well and look at your punctuation so um a lot of the really basic easy simple mistakes where you know you're involved in your writing you're engrossed in what you're trying to do you're trying to get down your stream of consciousness of what this thing's about but still spell check that thing uh, you know, make go back through it, read it, read it out loud, read it to a plastic duck to make sure it sounds like whichever language you're writing for, that it is, you know, actual sentences, words, actual content. Because otherwise, again, you're going to create a lot more work for your developer and the editor. Well, hopefully the editor doesn't have to deal with it by that point. But the point is you're just creating more work that you need to. And it looks like you're not really caring about your work that you're submitting. Um, any other simple mistakes people should not be doing? I cannot say this loudly enough or clearly enough. Read the brief. Yes, yes, the brief. Really brief. <laughs> if you've got 250 words to express something, you don't have time to bring in any other ideas, no matter how cool you are, how, how relevant you think the ideas are. You have to look at what the developer has asked for and write that thing. You're not necessarily, you're being paid because you're a good writer and because you bring good ideas to the team, but you're not being paid to just put your ideas on paper. Yeah. I've had that happen with a book that um, an, an, a writer sent in something that I really, really liked and it wasn't what I asked for and I couldn't use it in the book and I had to. Nope. Nope. It was sad because it was good, but it just wasn't wasn't what I needed for the book. Um, but if you send in a submission, another thing I would recommend is um, if you can, they'll tell you how long a submission can be. I think Onyx Path gives you a thousand words, which is fairly generous, and they want 500 um, setting and 500 mechanics. Um, if you've got that many words, absolutely do send in a mechanics portion, because in the industry, you will find more writers who are good at setting than writers who are good at mechanics, because mechanics is math. And yeah. Writers are generally not good at math, which means that if you are good at mechanics, uh, you've got something innovative and something smart and something, or just something that works, that works as it's written. Um, that is going to be something people notice. They'll be like, oh yeah, we should get that person on mechanics because they're good at it. And mechanics is, mechanics is interesting because that, that falls under what I would call technical writing because you're trying to express uh, a, pr a procedures that you go through so that there are no so it's obvious what's going on and there's no confusion because the last thing you want is to inadvertently put in things where 
it's where players start maybe potentially, you know, there are players out there that begin to abuse the rules because they go, well, that's how it's written. That may not have been the intention. So trying to really get the intention of the rules in there so it's clear what people should be doing in their games is is important and sometimes challenging. Um, but that's why it's, you know, technical writing is different to to, you know, let's just call it characterful writing, flavour writing, setting material. Uh, uh, anyone else want to jump in with any basic mistakes that people shouldn't be making? I think well, one thing that I would I would suggest um, from the more indie side of things where you don't actually get a briefing um, and you're just asked to send in something, like send in 500 words of something to us and maybe we'll hire you, um, would be to try to tailor what you send in to the company um, because very often when I get submissions, I can tell if the submission has been used over and over and over again. Um, so if you can tailor it, um, and, and let's say you only have one writing credit to your name, right? And you want to get in with a company that, and like, it's for something like that, some space Marine game or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, and like, you know, you're, you're trying to write for me, who's all about like, witches and darkness and something. You could also just in your cover letter, in your email to the person say, hey, this is the only experience I have, but I'm really interested in your company because of this. And to me, that means a lot. Um, just reading that someone put the extra effort in to say like, hey, I know your company and this is why I want to write for you. So that would be my suggestion. Cool. Uh, Lloyd, any um, simple things you've seen, which you just go, please don't do this? <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the easiest one I the easiest one I have is that make sure you send it to the right person, which is oh yeah, which is, yeah. Which is I know, I know, I know it's the most basic thing, but trust me, it happens way too much. You're like, well, oh, yep, push the send button to anyone on this reply all. I'm sure it's fine. You're like, that's the wrong person. That's not who you're supposed to send your work to. It's lost forever. I don't know where it is. I don't know what's going on. Um, the other one that I have seen that I've noticed going through is the language. But I believe Liz talked a bit about that. You have to know the language of what you're writing for. It helps if you go, okay, well, I know what they want. I, they've said what they said, but let me look through, make sure I've got the thing right. Because most, most line managers are trying to get the same language lined out throughout. So it makes up. So if you come in and you, and you start by changing the way things are worded and moving things around and using different, like instead of using the catchphrases that have been said and stayed through, make it up your own. It's going to look like in the, in the book, like it's, out of there a lot of writing for big big daddy books or your big ones like your star trek and stuff are done in sections and parts so when you have your section you have to try and match up the language to the left and to the right of you so it makes sense it's also partially part of the developer to help you with that but it also gives you that if you have an idea of what you're going for if you've seen a few of the stuff they've done before usually if you're writing big big daddy books you've got some material to look up you can check that out make sure you've got the idea right submit it be like i can also I, I i used i use a lot of this i hope this makes sense uh, let me do for some edits and also be happy to edit your work yeah which is something not a lot of people like to do i've noticed yes. none of us like getting red lines but you yes. do get them and you do have to just be professional yeah oh yeah. And, yeah and if i can say going into what lloyd said about using the right language this is some uh, this is a this is an area where as an experienced writer you get more leeway because people know that they can hire me for pretty much any book and setting and i will just spend two days catching up and then i will write exactly tailored to your setting it's not a problem that is part of why you hire me is for my ability to get to speed quick and just write to spec mm -hmm. but if you're new people don't know that you can do that so in that case your submission has to be tailored to what you need to write for Whereas when you're more experienced and more established, you can go, I don't actually know your book, but it does sound cool. And if you hire me and send me a copy, I'll be up to speed in no time and I can just write whatever you need me to, because that is part of my work. Um, but that is leeway that you get by being experienced and good at your work and that you won't have right out of the gate. So the more junior you are, the more you need to tailor your submissions to what you want to do. Uh, going back to something that Lloyd said as well um, about sending it to the right person and storing it in the right place, because obviously we do a lot of collaborative writing. It's, we've got so many collaborative writing tools for you know in the digital online cloud space. Is uh, you know make make use of version control, track your changes, all those things. Um, 
sometimes it's not quite easy to implement, make, but make sure like with, when you're writing, you will have perhaps a particular template. Make sure you have that properly installed. I fall yes, out for that. Template. Get it installed because the whole point of a template is that when it goes over to the person that then does layout, a lot of the things are baked in there, which means they're automatically dealt with when they put them into layout so that headings get the right, you know, get the right formatting and, and so forth. Um, and with a, that leads on to a good question, which is what are the pros and cons of self-publishing? Uh, I will say the, 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 co the pro, but it starts off as con, but then becomes a pro is you begin to learn about how to do things like layout if you're doing it yourself. So you begin to appreciate more about the process that's going on with, you know, with, with actual companies that you can get hired to. You understand why you have to do the things you have to do for your freelance gig. Um, the con of that is you're going you're gonna to have to learn all that. You're going to learn how to use something like Adobe InDesign or other software like that. There's Zara, there's Xfinity. They all do basically the same thing, which is lay out PDFs for print or for uh, web publishing and so forth. Um, so any other pros and cons of self-publishing? Anyone wants to jump in? Because we're on 15 minutes left, so we're going to crack through a few questions from the Twitch stream. Um, uh Oh, Kat, you're the expert. Let's go. Oh, hell no. <laughs> um, not an expert, not remotely. But the big pro of self-publishing is that you get to make what you want. None of this read the brief, none of this tailored to what your developer wants. You have an idea and you execute that idea and it's the chance to let your ego run absolutely free and make your dream book. Uh, cons are, there's a good chance no one will ever read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'll add to that if you're gonna do if you're gonna self-publish, even though you've not got a brief from a developer, work out a brief for yourself because the last thing you want is a blank slate because it's mm -hmm. nice to have some boundaries to work in because then you've got milestones and goals with your writing. Uh, Lloyd, did you have a point on that? Um, yes, uh, um, you what's called the cons is that you're going to learn how expensive it is to get everything done. <laughs> yeah. Holy bleep yeah. crap, you're like, I'll just, I'll just put some paper and then like put it. That's okay, I'll just put it on drive through, right? I'm not even gonna have to kickstart the book. Oh, wait, I still need art. Oh, wait, I need to do layer. Oh, wait, I need to figure this out. Oh, wait, I need to pay this. Oh, what am I? How does this work? Yeah, so I, I have a self published book, Stop and Sale, it's great, but that figuring out all those in between bits was tough work. Any other points on self-publishing? I mean, this likely leads through to pros and cons. Uh, and tips on Liz, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Liz talk about self-publishing because she does it a lot. But specifically for community content, I will say that your community content platform probably has guidelines on what you can and can't do. You yeah. need to read them and you need to stick to them, or they're gonna pull your product. That's been a thing. Well, I won't get into it, but it's been a thing. So um, keep that in mind. Can confirm. Um, yeah, no, I think I think you know the pros are what everyone said. It's amazing to publish your own work, um, but also if you're looking at it monetarily, and I think this is a conversation. Steffi and I work a lot together. She's my platonic design partner um, for everything in my life. Um, <laughs> but if you want to uh, if you want to make a career out of this um, and you want to support yourself, I think self-publishing at the very start is a position of privilege. Um, if you think that you're going to make money off of it from your very first start, you may be highly successful and amazing and that may happen, but most likely you're not going to. Um, so the big pro to just freelancing and working in the industry is if you can get enough jobs, and that's a big if, um, you know how much money you're making. Whereas with self-publishing, you very much don't at the start. And it's taken a very long while, for example, for my company to turn profitable um, and to be where it is today. So, and, and, and that's because I was privileged enough to have a job and work alongside that. And if you don't have that um, and you're counting on that money for self-publishing, that's going to be very, very difficult. Um, and yeah, that's, I, that's the only thing I can add. I could talk hours about this. <laughs> oh, I actually have one more thing. Um, when it comes to not community content, community content, the, the IP goes into the community, you don't own it, um, or rather the community owns it. But if you write your own book, mm -hmm. everything in here, Liz and I own everything. Um, so if you write your own IP, if you wanna go, I own this, um, you need to self-publish because work for hire, as the, as the term implies, work for hire, the company owns what you write. Um, and that pays bills, and I actually love working for pretty much all the companies I've worked for. 
uh, because it gets you in touch with people and I love the collaborative process, but keep in mind that you won't own what you write, no matter how attached you get to it, no matter how much you pour your soul into it, you don't own it. Uh, community content, you pour your soul into it and then the community owns it, which means that uh, under most community content, but read the fine print, any, anyone in a community can take your content and use it for their book, but Kat would know more about that. Uh, but if you self-publish, you own it. This is mine. All of all of these ideas, are, well, half of them are Liz's, but that is basically the same thing. Like, I own what Liz owns, and Liz owns what I own. That's mine. So, um, so that is the thing about self-publishing. Does that pay as well? I think in the end, it, it compared to some of my freelance jobs, yes, that it was more of a hustle. But, and that's also because we have history behind our Kickstarter, right? Like Free Hamster had a fan base, you had a fan I know, base, so I we know. were able to do that. So that's... Yeah, this, this, this in the end paid off uh, through the Patreon and the Kickstarter, which and the Kickstarter leaned heavily on the success and the success of Angry Hamster. So, um... Okay. Um, and then with with Kickstarters, is there any anything in particular with that compared to self publishing? So w whether it's community or or through you know just putting it on to drive through RPG where you, or, or equivalent you know outlets, there are others um, you can put your work out onto. But Kickstarter is a different beast, obviously, because you're you're asking people for funds to fund your your writing process. So I guess how much how much do you need to have ready for kickstarter like how much of your work should be ready to show off um things like that and and just running a kickstarter i guess for an rpg any quick tips on that if i would say if, <laughs> if you want to have it delivered in any amount of time i normally have like 70 percent to 90 percent of the book done um before i launch it on kickstarter that said, if this is your passion project and you just want to put your project on Kickstarter and you tell people it's going to be done in two years, that's perfectly fine. But because I'm doing it as a business and I want to be able to deliver my book within four months or so, you know, once all the art comes in, because normally Kickstarter is funding part of that, um, you have to have a majority of your book done, um, I would suggest, and have all the business side worked out. Like what Lloyd said about like, oh God, I have to pay for art. Oh, I have to do this. That was my first Kickstarter experience. Um, and I thought I had gone into it well planned. Um, and I ended up having to crack open my savings to fund my first book. Um, so, uh, so also having the business side 100% planned out, I would definitely suggest for, and being prepared to be more successful than you are um, and knowing what you're going to add to it because there's this Kickstarter high that you get where you think you're invincible and you funded and now you're over, you're like, I'm 5,000 euros overfunded. I'm just going to give away free decks of cards, which was my first Kickstarter. That is the absolute worst thing to do that you could possibly do. <laughs> like, do not do it. Like, have everything planned out. Know what your stretch goals are and know that you can afford them. Because if you don't have that parachute that I had, like I said, luckily I was working, you you will really run into some problems. And I think a lot of a lot of us can all attest to backing Kickstarters and seeing that happen. And it, it's not good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and um, Kickstarter bloat is a thing that they add stretch goals and stretch goals and stretch goals. And we've seen very successful companies run extremely successful Kickstarters. And then years later, still be like, oh, yeah, we still owe people books. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> it's a, I mean, my, my big secret is finding a publishing partner who knows about Kickstarters. But yeah, I have um, noticed as a, as a customer that there is such a thing as Kickstarter bloat. Being aware of the time, I think now is a good time to wrap up. Uh, obviously, there are plenty more questions. I think, obviously, we can mostly field all these on social media, on things like Twitter or Facebook. Obviously, if you have plenty of questions and you want me to forward them to the panelists here, uh, send them over to darkerdaysradio at gmail.com. That will be, you can, if you go over to Dark Days Radio on Twitter, you can put the questions there. If you go to Dark Days Radio on Facebook, put the questions there. Uh, if you go to Dark Days Radio, um, also there are plenty of episodes on www.darker-days.org where you can listen to some of these writers we've interviewed before on there. Some of them we have not, and we will likely interview them in future as certain books come out and so forth. <laughs> Uh, where can everyone find you uh, if they want to ask questions directly to you about your products or games or whatever you're writing on? Uh, Steffi and Liz, I guess Angry Hamster has a Twitter. 
Uh, Angra Hamster has a Twitter. Uh, I also have my own Twitter as 100 Things I Love. And it has a link tree with all the links that we need. And I will yell at people. Not the, not the nice people who Twitter me, but I yell a lot on Twitter. <laughs> and I do uh, a lot yeah. of game news. Um, yeah, Angry Hamster is at Angry Hamster RPG. And if, yeah, if anyone has any follow-up questions to what, uh, what was asked today, I'm really happy to answer them. So please. Cool. Uh, Kat, your Twitter or best contact? Uh, best place to find me is on Twitter at Perpetual Gloom. That's also the name of my store on Itch.io. That's perpetualgloom.itch.io. Cool. Where you can and find Lloyd. horror games oh, and stuff. No, oh, sorry, just rambling. Sorry. <laughs> and Lloyd. Um, hi, I'm also on Twitter as Drug Dwarf, but like, honestly, it's just nonsense in there. Don't, don't do it. It's not worth it. <laughs> like, don't, don't, don't pop it. Just, just, just don't. I just, okay. Drug Dwarf. Okay. Excellent. Okay. And with that, I will thank everyone again for uh, obviously coming on this panel, chatting. Thank everyone in the Twitch stream for watching, for asking questions, for asking us questions in future, uh, and for subscribing to all of our wonderful things and buying wonderful things off, you know, whatever outlet you want to buy your books and RPGs from. And with that, I think we can finish for this morning and uh, go have breakfast or whatever, because it's very early for a lot of us. Yes. But thank you again. And we will hopefully do more of this stuff in future. We do have more streams coming for different online conventions as well. There are much things in the future, but enjoy the rest of virtually expo because there's lots of cool things going on so goodbye goodbye